There you go. All right. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue with our sermon series that we started a few weeks ago. You may remember we spoke about the parable of the soils, right? And then last week, we spoke about the parables in general and the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven, and that there really isn't much of a difference. They are the same. Most of the times, they are synonymous. Today, we're going to take a look at the parable of the wheat and the tares. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter th 13, and put a bookmark there. Now, when we looked at the parable of the soils, we learned that not every, I'll wait for everybody to get there. Matthew chapter 13. Okay. If you guys remember a few weeks ago when we spoke about the parable of the soils, one of the lessons that you draw from that is that not every person responds to the gospel or the kingdom of Christ in exactly the same way. Some people have hearts that are hard. And they have ears that are dull. They won't even allow the word an opportunity to grow in their heart. Others are going to receive the word, but either troubles, persecution, or other things in this life are going to make them fruitless. Only those with good hearts, with noble hearts, who receive the word with patience and keep the word will hear the intent, bear the intended fruit in their lives. Now, one of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is that it's going to be received by some, but not by all. The truth is illustrated even further when Jesus tells us the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, this parable, unlike many of the others, is recorded in only one of the Gospels, and that is the Gospel of Matthew. So let's read that together. Matthew chapter 13. Let's start in verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to them, what? Oh, gather them? And he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my home. So what was the purpose of this lesson? And it's really to teach lessons about the kingdom of heaven. As you notice, Jesus Christ began this parable with the kingdom of heaven is like. Therefore, Jesus wants to reveal the principles that are related to the rule of God, as it would soon be revealed in the personhood of his son. Jesus is teaching this. Not everyone is yet aware that he is the Messiah at this point. So like the parable of the soils, this parable is one of the few in which we have an explanation directly from the teacher, directly from Jesus Christ. And the explanation is given in response to his apostles' inquiry. You're in Matthew chapter 13. Let's start reading in verse 36. 
Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, explained to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Now, when we're dealing with a parable, which sometimes has a lot of language that's the the intention of the parables was to hide the meaning from other people so that they couldn't get upset to hide the teachings it would be revealed to those who were supposed to know so what we see is in this particular case jesus christ is going to give an explanation let's pick up in 37 he answered the one who sows the good seed is the son of man the field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom, all causes of sin and law stop all causes of sin and lawbreakers please don't tell me there's no requirement that we live a christian life in order to maintain our salvation we just read it 42 and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Stop. Do you know there are some people within the field of Christian theology who teach there is no such thing as hell? That's not what I'm reading in this verse. And they're wrong. 43. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So the question is, what kind of heart do you have? And do you have ears? Because Jesus explained this in response to the question from his apostles. So who's the sower? The sower is the son of man, or Jesus, the Christ. Christ, in his preaching, went about proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we're going to see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Go there, please. Since we have some new people, if the person right next to you is having trouble finding it, help them out. All right. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among people. So, hold on. Who this son of man is identified for us in Daniel's vision as the one who received the kingdom. This is going to take a minute. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. 14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. Stop. Hold on a second. You have to remember at the time that Daniel is writing, this is being written under the Levitical or Mosaic covenant. 
the Levitical or Mosaic covenant was only for the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. It wasn't for everybody else. But as we just read in Daniel, all people, all nations, all languages are to serve God. This is no longer just a genealogy of Abraham. This is for all people. And they're going to serve him. His dominion is as an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's a promise, isn't it? So what we see here is that Jesus the Christ is identifying himself as the Son of Man, which is the prophecy from Daniel chapter 7. Now, we also see that in Matthew 28, how much authority? All authority has been given unto me. And after his ascension into heaven, he's going to tell us that he has received all authority. Go to Revelations chapter 2, verse 26. Revelations chapter 2, verse 26. When the pages quit, everybody got it. The one who conquers and the one who keeps my word. Stop. The one who does what? Keeps my works. Until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod. There you go, a rod of iron. By the way, has anybody in the room ever been spanked? If you've been spanked, raise your hand. Do you, would you like your parents to use a rod of iron when they're spanking you? No, right? That's going to hurt, right? That's the rule. Now, we're also going to see this in John chapter 3, verse 26. Take a look there. John chapter 3, verse 26. John chapter 3, verse 26. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I believe, but I'm not I'm gonna live like I want to live. That's not how this works. So when we take a look and we compare the parable of the soils, we come up with some metaphors. And the disciples are those who constitute the good soil in which the seed has been shown as we look at the parable of the soils. But in the parable of the wheat and tares, the disciples are the good seed themselves. The, therefore, when we receive the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, we can become the good seed, the good seed being a son of the kingdom. So then we want to ask, what are the tares? The tares are the sons of the wicked ones, sons of perdition, those who are defined in that they practice lawlessness. They practice a lifestyle that does not represent Christ. Those of you who've been here for a while, haven't used this metaphor in a while, have heard me talk about undercover Christians, right? Or secret agent Christians. No, there's no such thing. We have to be Christians or we're not. Matthew chapter 13, <laughs> verse 41. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. Chapter 13, verse 41. Go with me. The Son of Man will send his angels and, and they will gather out of his kingdom 
all the causes of sin and all law breakers. You're going to have to follow the teachings of Christ. Now, within the realm of the Lord's reign, and God is going to later gather these people out for his kingdom, they clearly, these sons of perdition, are clearly not submitting to the Lord's authority. Their actions reveal that they are really sons of perdition or sons of the wicked one. And by the way, we've all had relationships, friends or whatever. You ever had a friend that keeps saying, you're my friend, you're my friend, but they don't act like it? Well, there are people who say, you're my friend to God, and they're really not. Um, so who is in within the precept of our parable who is the enemy the enemy is the one who sowed them is the devil now i don't have time to dig into all of this but if we take a look at matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 you can see that's for your reading later the the devil attempted to tempt christ and now he wants to destroy the efforts of christ to save souls. Why? He wants to enlarge his own rule, his own kingdom. So what is the harvest? The harvest is the end of the age, the age in which the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. People who receive the gospel can become sons of the kingdom. And that's this present dispensation. We've spoken about this in the past. There have been a multitude or at least several different dispensations. There was the Adamic covenant, which was a covenant between Moses, Adam and God. Do what I tell you to do. Don't eat of the fruit. You get to stay in the Garden of Eden. Did man live up to his bargain? No. Then there was the Mosaic covenant. That's the covenant that God put up with the rainbow he said he will never again destroy the earth through a flood and then there was the sorry i said that wrong the noahic covenant between noah and then there was the mosaic or levitical covenant that we respond to so what we see is now we live under a christian covenant it's a different deal this gospel is not for it was it's ours it's time for now. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We are now aware in the kingdom of Jesus the Christ. This age is going to end with a great harvest. And this harvest is identified as the come second coming of Christ and the appearance that he's going to have. Go to Matthew 26, 31. Read it with me. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will fall. flock will be scattered. 32. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Christ is establishing his kingdom. We can also see something very similar in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14. 
First Timothy chapter six, verse fourteen. To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 15. Which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. So who is the king of kings? Jesus the Christ. Who is the lord of lords? Jesus the Christ. Wait a minute. What about our friends who belong to denominations or sects within Christendom who deny the divinity of Jesus the Christ? I'm sorry, that's not what scripture tells us. So who are the reapers? And the reapers are the angels. By the way, those of you who've been here for a while know the answer. Angels are always 12 foot tall, pure white, got wings and a halo, right? Uh -huh. No, because angels is the Greek word angelos, and it means messenger, okay? Go to First Thess. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven. And we're gonna read through nine, so let's get started. And to grant relief to you who were afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So what are the angels going to do? Well, according to Matthew chapter 13, verse 49, they are going to separate the good from the bad. Okay, now Jesus explains to us, he stresses some points within this parable. And the problem of the tares is not going to be fully addressed until when? Until the end of the age. So you may ask, why are these false teachers allowed to roam the earth? If we look at the book of 1 John, it says there have been many antichrists, meaning against Christ, who have gone out into the world. Why are they allowed there? Because Christ says they will be allowed until the end of the age. This is done out of consideration for the good seed, we saw that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 29. In 41, at the end of the age, the Son of Man is going to solve the problem. With his angels, he's going to gather out of the kingdom all the causes of sin and all the lawbreakers, the sons of perdition. In verse 42, those who are gathered to his kingdom will be dealt with. How are they going to be dealt with? They're going to be dealt with because they're going to be cast into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. If we look at verse 43, the blessedness of the righteous, the good seed, the sons of the kingdom is described. After the harvest, we get to shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Do we hear what Jesus the Christ is saying? Do I? Or uh, am I dull of hearing? Because if you're willing to listen, there are truths that can be gathered from this parable and how it relates to the kingdom of heaven.
the church and our personal lives. The truths that are gathered from the parable tell us that Christ is long suffering. He has much patience so that you and I, so that we can grow. So why does Christ tolerate the wicked that are around us? Why doesn't he just come in judgment against the sons of perdition? Perhaps to give you, the son of the kingdom, time to grow. We have two brand new sisters. They are newborns in Christ. They have not yet reached their spiritual maturity. Those of you who are parents understand what I'm talking about. When you come, if you take a baby home from the hospital today, Anya, should we give Anya a steak and potatoes? Yes. No, why? Because still a baby, right? But later on, by the way, if you're 15 years old and you're still sucking on a bottle, <laughs> there's a problem, right? The problem is we have too many Christians who have been Christians for 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years and they're still sucking on a bottle. It's time for some steak and potatoes by now, folks. You got to grow. Christ is giving us the opportunity to grow. Now, Peter says that it's the Lord's long suffering or patience that prompts the delay that we may recognize coming. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Read it with me. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What does Christ want all men to do? Reach repentance. Are they all going to do it? No. However, Christ has a special interest in the sons and daughters of the kingdom that are still growing. And if you stop growing, there's a problem. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we supposed to do? And go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. You see, Christ rules not only now, but he's going to turn the kingdom over to the Father when he comes again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. We're going to go 23 to 26, so read it with me. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. You see, Christ is coming to establish a kingdom not on this earth, but after this earth. You may be one of the sons of the kingdom now, but does that guarantee you're going to be a son or daughter of the kingdom later? Now, angels are going to gather out of the kingdom when they come back. The ones that belong to Christ, we saw that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. However, they're also going to cast into furnace those who are the sons of perdition, verse 42. So who would these be? Who are going to be the ones that are cast into the furnace? Those who offend, those who cause others 
to stumble against whom Jesus warned his disciples to be careful of them. Go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. And we are going to read 6 and 7. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be thrown into hell. What, didn't anybody here know what a millstone actually is? A millstone is used for grinding grain. And it's a huge stone that turns corn and wheat into flour. Uh, Paul, uh, having that tied around your neck. Anybody here can swim? Joseph, I know you can swim, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. And if we tie two concrete hollow blocks around your neck, how's your swimming going to go? <laughs> it will be hard. What's that? It will be hard for you. It, you're going to swim straight to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, Paul is going to talk about this when he's talking to the Christians in Corinth, in Rome, uh, go to Romans chapter 14, verse 20. Romans chapter 14, verse 20. <laughs> Okay, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. We are permitted many things under the Christian covenant, but if you're causing somebody else to sin, don't do it. Now, what about the wicked? Do they get a reward? And they do. We see that those who practice lawlessness, they're going to be cast into a furnace of fire. And they are going to experience wailing and gnashing of teeth. And we see that this is going to be a common theme throughout many of the parables of Christ. This includes the parable of the dragnet, the parable of the unforgiving servant. It's also seen in the judgment scene where Christ takes a place prepared for the wicked. So, indeed, it's, every parable is really a warning to us to not allow ourselves to be influenced by the wicked one. And as Peter describes our adversary, he's very much seeking to destroy us. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. First Peter chapter five, verse eight. Be, oh, first Peter chapter five, verse eight. Look at me when you got it, so I'll know who's got it. All right, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Verse 9. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that he has the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. However, if we allow the word of God to live in our lives... We can overcome anything the wicked one wants to do. Go to 1 John 2, 14. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. First John chapter 2, verse 14. I write to you, Father, because you know who... He is from the beginning. I write to you, young man, because you are strong, and the word of God 
abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Have we? He who has ears, let him hear. Defeat Satan every day. And I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you because it's an absolute truth in life. You and I are tempted on a regular basis. Think about any sin life that you've gotten yourself into. If you give in today, will it be easier to resist tomorrow? Or will it be just easier to give in again? And that's how a pattern of sin starts in life. We see that the free gift of God is eternal salvation for anybody who will take it. However, we have to do our part. We have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And then you have to repent. Luke chapter 13, verse 3 says, No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then you have to confess your faith in Jesus the Christ. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart one believes and is justified. And it is with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Great. We made our great confession. Now we have to be baptized. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Great. Once baptized, always saved, right? Revelations chapter 2, verse 10 says, Remain faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Well, that's a conditional if statement. If you don't remain faithful, guess what? No crown for you, right? 